Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with embodiment specialists from around the world. I'm your host, Mark Walsh. So today we're joined by Paul Linden. Paul Linden is the founder of Being in Movement Mind Body Training. He's a six degree black belt in Aikido, black belt in karate, trained in Feldenkrais by Moshe Feldenkrais himself, works with trauma, peace building, children with ADHD, a huge selection of things around the world. So Paul, welcome. I'm glad to be here. So we've known each other for over 10 years, been my mentor for most of that time. How did you get into working with the body? Because this has been a long journey for you. Well, it was because I was a klutz and an intellectual. I took a course at university on, taught by Robert Frazier on the psychology of meditation. And I didn't find myself interested in his Aikido, which he talked about all the time, having just come back from Japan. But the last day of the class, he showed a film of the men who created Aikido. And something in me said, yes. I didn't understand it, but I said, yes. And I showed up and I never stopped. And this was sort of back in the swing 60s at Berkeley, was it? Berkeley, 1969. So this was the height of the kind of hippie hippie uh, era. Well, 67 was the height of the hippie era. It was the summer of love 50 years ago. Wow. And you've been doing the martial art of Aikido since then? For 48 years, since 69. Wow. And what I experienced was that I couldn't do anything. Every, I remember my first class, everybody said, move the other left foot. Everybody said that. And I realized at some point that there was something missing in my body. So I started making up exercises for myself to practice those things. So you were not a natural to say the least. I was a natural at being unnatural. <laughs> and in order to improve, you kind of broke it down into pieces and said, okay, well, other people may be getting this intuitively, but I need to look at this in smaller chunks. Smaller chunks, analyze, and come out with the principles. I couldn't reproduce a movement, but I could understand the logic and practice that. And you're known for your fairly sort of uh, breaking things down and obsessive practice over the years. Well, obsessiveness is a virtue if you use it virtuously. And just, we'll come on to it at some point, but if people can hear some background noise, Paul has Parkinson's and uh, it's shaking the chair somewhat, isn't it? it? I usually start off workshops by saying I'm here to shake things up, and I do. Well, why don't we talk, we'll go actually straight into that then, and we can sort of fill in the space in between. Um, you've talked about blending with Parkinson's before. What it means is, when I was first diagnosed, it was Parkinson's, oh my God, and I spent six months going... Parkinson's, <sighs> till I could trick my body into feeling good about the Parkinson's. And that minimizes its impact. It certainly gets worse when I, if I don't like the tremors. I don't feel, find much that I dislike about the Parkinson's. It's, it's inconvenient. But if I make it worse than that, it will become worse. And this is you know, really a metaphor for a lot of different things, isn't yes. it, in terms of your work, that we get attacked, whether it be physically in Aikido, whether it be through illness like Parkinson's, whether it be someone verbally saying something we don't like, getting a new president that you uh, don't enjoy, and then the response is yes. what we moderate. What we do normally, what we're equipped for is fight, flight, freeze, or collapse, which is becoming small, whether tense with anger, tense with shock, collapse with resignation, dissociation. And the antidote to that is to find the core of your body and make, make yourself spacious. And this is really the heart of your work, as I've followed it over the years, whether you apply, you apply this to all sorts of areas. Right. I've worked with musicians. I've worked with abuse survivors. It's all the same work. Our natural response is to become small. And if you do that, you start losing touch with your own capabilities. You lose touch with the resources that you do have. You can't find new resources, and you'll be moved in the direction of opposition and antagonism. And this isn't to say you isn't to say you like your Parkinson's or Donald Trump or any other things that you might find difficult in life, or that you're passive somehow to those things. Right. It's just that I have to. I feel good at the attack, not for the attack. 
generally people and I, let's go straight to the heart of your works and I know everyone listens to a whole podcast and I think this is a really world changing message you know it's the heart of what you do power and love talk about that power is an experience and it's very often in our culture called negative because people associate power with people who've hurt them or hurt someone. All power is abusive. Like power kind of. corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Power is not power without love. It's brutality. And love without power is ineffective. Because people want to say, hey, I don't want to be powerful. I'm going to be loving. All we need is love. <laughs> da, 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 da. Your generation, not mine. <laughs> no, well, that's true, but that wasn't true then. We need power plus love as far as I'm concerned. They are the same thing in the body. So this is a fundamental misconception. I see this played out in different ways. So someone might say, look, I'm a tough guy at work, but I have to be to get the job done, even if I brutalize myself or other people. Or they might say, well, because I'm nice, you know, I want to be poor or I want to be physically weak or whatever kind of power they're sort of disowning in, in a kind of attempt to be nice. When I work with movement, I can show people very quickly and very clearly that if they become powerful in the negative sense, they become a pushover. I can literally push them over. So there's loads of video on YouTube if you put in Paul Linden and right. you know, I've we videoed you showing this. And this is, I think, the power of your work. It's one thing to talk about this sort of philosophically, isn't it? And we might argue and disagree and say, well, I think this. And you know, I define love and power differently. And you, whenever anyone does that in your workshops, you sort of say, come here. Right. And then you Try show them it. something. Everything I do is empirical, testable. I don't want people to take my word for anything. If it doesn't work for them and their purposes, it doesn't work. It's not useful. But if they are loving and stable, they can resist me quite easily. If they are unloving, they find it harder to resist when you I say push. say resist, you mean when you're trying to push them yes, or some right. sort of, you, you work for, the, for Aikido, for physical movements right. that are technically difficult for people, but they clearly and quickly get feedback as to the differences in state the the those the the whatever the thing is and they get I guess what I like about it is people don't have to believe you like a religious system. Exactly. They don't have to believe me at all. And I I rarely use complex Aikido movements with non Aikidos. I do something simple. I might grab their wrist and say, Don't let me pull you toward me. Yeah, and people's response is to pull back. Right. Which is a solution. But if I pull them and they come with me, they they are not affected and they are in charge. So I can set up something where they experience the logic, not just believe it. Yeah, and, and, it's, and I've taken your work into business quite a lot, and it's really popular in that sense that where I say, look, don't believe me, let's test this. Let's look at the data. Did it make a difference? And, and was the difference useful? Yeah, you? was it functional for what you're interested in? Um, and, and starting with what people care about in that way. I mean, one thing on this podcast we try and do is give people little experiments to do. So that they might, people might be listening to this driving or on the subway or walking along the street in London or wherever. What's a little experiment they can do, like your Parkinson's right. yes or whatever? Okay. What they can do, if, if they don't mind looking foolish, wrinkle up your nose like an angry bunny rabbit and walk around that way. Feel your body, feel your legs, feel your feet on the ground, and let your nose relax. Almost everybody will experience that their feet relax as well. It's a web. When you resist or tighten any element of the web, the whole thing goes. And that's not just physical, it's mental as well. Great. So let's break that down. So that's the first part here is that everything's connected to everything else. Yes. And, you know, we might conveniently talk about body, mind, but actually yes. it, just the body, everything's connected. First of all, like Gary had Gary Carter on here talking about fascial network, you know, is literally connected through the yes. body. Um, but then as you say, you know, body and mind, how do you think about body and mind? I don't. If I am holding you, holding you this way, what am I holding? Well, you might say my wrist. And I would say, all of you, yeah. if I pull you 10 feet, does your wrist come without your sense of humor and your bad jokes? Sure, everything comes. <laughs> right. Just to be aware that um, uh, some people listening from the podcast, some people will be watching the video. So if you grab me or things like that, people okay. won't always be able to see it. So that the first thing is that everything uh, is, connected. is connected and not in an abstract hippie sense, right. but you know, quite literally. Yes. The next piece is if you put a pen down three or four meters in front of you, three or four yeah. yards in front of you, and stand and relax and look at the pen and want it, what do you experience in your body? And people can try this. They yes. can literally put a pen on the floor. They can look across the office or look across the subway and, you know, look at, you know, whatever it is. It'll have to be a pen, right? Right, and want it. Yeah. Most people experience a slight tipping toward. 
That's my definition of intention. Intention is a commitment to move through space in some direction for some purpose. And you, you almost see people as stru- structurally a set of intentional directions. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so if you move forward and want forward, but don't remember up, down, left, right, and back, you're unbalanced. If you, the meditative line, I believe, is the vertical line through the body. Fear pulls you back. Anger pushes you forward. And if you can stay in the vertical, that's an antidote. And, and this is something people can practice if they're walking, but they shouldn't be doing this if they're, um, you know, got cars near them and shouldn't do this driving. Is that you can actually walk one way while having and sending intention to one side, yes. and you'll actually start to lean and eventually walk in that direction. But that okay, careful if there's cars around. That was one of my first experiments. I would go into the, the, the martial arts studio and no one was around, and think, feel one spot, and say my shoulder wishing to move to the left. And then walk forward and see what it did to think one way and move, move with that thought. And that was how I built up my sensitivity to the body as a process of thought. And it's been said that you treat yourself as a lab rat pool and you'll, you'll go and sort of breathe in intentional directions for 10 years or, you know, go and walk around for an hour a day kind of in, in these things. There's a level of sort of obsessiveness that you've uh, oh, yes. cultivated here. Uh, I think you, the, the verb is I am firm, you are stubborn, he is pig headed. I am not obsessive. I'm interested. Interested in your subject. Absolutely. Which means obsessive. <laughs> and what about this fight, flight, this distress response that occurs and people can experience this in their own body, right? It's fairly straightforward sure. to if, simulate. If, somebody, if you think of somebody, the boss from hell or the spouse from hell or something, you will feel the distress response trigger off in your body. And people can do that now. Listening to this again, you don't have to take our word for it. They can just take a moment, think of someone non-traumatic but irritating. Yeah. You know, and notice what happens, right? What they do in their body. And the, the place to start is, this is what I, I do in my body when I feel irritated. The next place is, do you do irritated or do I do it when I feel it? You are doing something. You don't make me irritated. I make myself feel irritation about what you do. So people say you made me angry, but actually a truer statement is... I make myself angry over you. Yeah, so people are... And of course... They have to be just logically, because if one person's angry, let's say, you know, someone walks in here, say my wife, and one of us is angry, one of us isn't. Well, it can't have been her that caused it just logically. You know, we're responsible for our own motor system. That's We are if we have the tools and the perception. Yeah. We are anyway, but we can't do anything. So the first thing is to perceive it and notice, have enough body awareness is the basis of all your exactly. work, right? And to say, right, I'm noticing what I'm doing in my body. It's just the frame of self-responsibility and then actually to be able to do something different. Right. I, I often will punch somebody in the stomach, lightly, of course, and say, I punched you hard. Does that hurt? And they'll say, yes, of course. And I'll say, why? Well, because you punched me. Then I have them punch me and I block the punch. I say, you're talking about locus of responsibility. It's tr- you're talking about how the world should be. No one should punch you. That's true. But I'm talking about how the world is. I have to take responsibility what happens to me even though it isn't my responsibility people may hear this as sort of victim blaming somehow and you no, work not at all and you work with some really serious victims like people that have been seriously abused and that's the sort of your bread and butter right. work isn't it yes it's not blaming the victim it's simply saying if you have the resources to protect yourself then you do if you don't can you speak chinese no you're learning russian i am <laughs> chinese <laughs> is the next hardest <laughs> right well if you can't speak chinese you can't be faulted for not understanding something when somebody says to you something to you in Chinese. Mm. If you're five years old and somebody hits you with a two by four, could you be faulted for not knowing the self-defense? Yeah. Or if you're an adult, yeah. if you haven't studied it, you won't know it. And what's very interesting is when you, and I've, you know, I've been present when you've worked with people that have been physically, sexually, et cetera, abused, when you teach them the self-defense, which is different from any other therapist that I've come across. Not a therapist, an educator. For, for, for legal reasons in America, we call Paul in an educator, another therapist. Okay. So um, as an educator, uh, you're the only person I know who's worked with people who've been abused, who not only, you know, empathically listens to what they have to say, but actually teaches them a practical skill. Right. If you've, if you've fallen in the water and you go to a therapist with fear of water, they can work with the fear. But if nobody teaches you to swim, you'll, you'll always be a fearless victim. And I teach people to swim. And when they do, when they feel their, their capacity to create their own safety, 
they light up with a bl- glorious smile. It's it's particular look, isn't it? And I've seen this many times in your workshops and one to one work that I've sat in on. The when you teach person the sort of self defense move that could have they could have used when someone was attacking them or raping them or whatever if it was. They could have, but yeah. they couldn't have. Yeah, so we're not there's no sense of blaming them for that, you know, at the time. But it's saying, look, this is actually I want to equip you for the future. You're free now. And, and they, they change, don't they? If you, they there's a something that happens to them that's quite unique. Their whole body lights up. They feel free. Mm. And so, they are free because they're no longer in the position of having to structure their lives based on weakness. Now they can structure their lives based on their capacities, their capabilities. And what is it you say? Therapists teach you this, but I teach you that? Therapists t- teach you how to relieve your anxiety and process your emotions, which is crucial. I teach you how to fight and win. And it doesn't necessarily mean fighting, fighting. If a pianist has a difficult passage to play, that's a challenge. It's, all, it's an attack, in a sense. And the same thing that will help an abuse, <coughs> an abuse survivor find his or her power will help the pianist play with power and sensitivity. So when people have uh, an attack, whether it's a sort of a thought, like a memory or psychological thought, or actually in the moment, or some anxiety or whatever it is, uh, let's be specific. What kind of things happen in the body? Because it's pretty cross-cultural, isn't it? We've done this yes. in about 30 countries, and we see the same stuff and I've had people, I've had people write from different countries. Uh, one of my stu- <coughs> students was from India. He taught it to a woman in a small village. And in one session, she was able to use it to solve her family problems. It's not... It's, it's wired in. It's a technology. It's not natural. It's something you have to study and learn. So the response is wired in, and, and then the, the, what we're teaching is, is, is technology. technology. So this response, so for example, I was teaching group today, and I said, okay, when someone threw the tissue at you, it's a classic way that you work, very right. gentle, introductory way you it's work. It's an attack, people. but so minimal that hardly anybody objects so to it's it. safe. No one's traumatized by Kleenex. You know, it's low-level stimulus to be working with. And um, I say, who, you know, who um, relaxed and opened and softened in an expansive, radiant way? And everyone laughs because no, I know even though I've got people from, from 10 different countries in that room, nobody's going to have that response. Right. Now I say, who tightened their belly? A load of hands go up. Whose breathing either stopped or became more shallow? Right. A load of hands come up. Who tightened? Who twisted? Who, you say, smallified? Yes. I mean, say more about this pattern that's so common. Well, I don't know what more to say other than the fact that people become smaller in a number of different ways. And that's not just physically, it's cognitively, emotionally. They become small and separate. They dehumanize the other and they dehumanize themselves. And the antidote is to be open. Now, I, I don't tell people to be open. I might have them cross their arms over their chests and feel how defensive and closed that feels. And I, I reframe that as an hypothesis. The hypothesis is that if you build a barrier, you can hide behind it and you'll be safe. Because it's quite counterintuitive, your work, isn't it? Because people Very. will feel like, yeah, I'm safe now. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I've tightened my body. I've put my arms around myself. I've, and they're shutting off mentally and they're actually becoming meaner, stupider, less creative, right. weaker. And these are all testable things. I'm yes. not saying it's like a judgment. Exactly. It's, a, it's a test. You'll get people to count in maths, you know, count the seven times table. You'll get people to push to test their physical strength. The simple way to test is when they cross their arms over their chest, I can poke them. They right. can't stop me. When they open their arms up and, and breathe, then I poke them and they, they swat you aside me away in this relaxed because way. they're free and they can move. So it might sound like Paul's this terrifying man who's, who's sort of attacking everyone left, right, and center. And um, that was how you were known in Russia at one point, was the nice little old man who attacked everyone. That's how someone described you. Yeah. But you attack them with... Um, the, Gentleness and caring. Yes, and this consent. And, you're, you know, it's calibrated. So, you, for example, you use your legendary attack ducks. You're quite fond of them, yes. aren't you? I, I like the attack quack, ducks. Quack, 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 quack. <laughs> I have a herd of t- ducks trained to pinch people. Not hard, but it's very annoying if they let themselves be annoyed. And so I use silly things. I'll often use, you have too many noses. They're raising your voice, but in a way which isn't, you know, something someone's going to have been shouted at right, them. It's exactly. an abstract thing. Right. Or yeah. I might shout, cookies. Yeah. yeah. Which, and then they get to work with that. And exactly. then you can calibrate it to, in order to sort of make it worse if need be so they can find their edge. Right? Well, I rarely need to calibrate it into worse. Mm. I did once have a, a special forces soldier in one of my workshops. And he said, I'm sorry, but throwing Kleenex at me doesn't stir anything. 
So I walked up to him and I pulled his mustache and he got this look in his eyes like he was going to kill me. <laughs> I said, now you're upset. <laughs> yeah, I had a soldier once and I said, do you mind if I kiss you? And that freaked him out so much. And I said, oh, what happens if you're breathing when I ask if I can kiss you? And that worked fine. Like, yeah, I didn't actually have to kiss him, nor what, what no, I wanted to. But it, just, uh, just the idea was enough to freak this, this guy out. And so there's always something you can use if you're creative. And um, people should listen to the podcast on centering. I've done a several podcasts on specifically on centering that people can listen to for more on the sort of principles of this. And, uh, you know, today I was working with someone, someone said, what do I do with kids? And I said, well, one of your favorite ones is tickling, right? Like right. working with tickling. With their permission. And then they learn to regulate themselves because no one likes that. Kids don't like that overwhelmed feeling of not being able to stop. And if they center, if they soften mm. their core, if they feel friendly toward me, if they invite me to tickle them, they can turn off the ticklishness. And then they feel empowered. And it's been, again, it's been demonstrated. It's yes. empirical. It's like the guy going, oh, I suddenly got stronger and you couldn't push me over. Or exactly. I suddenly got better at the maths that I was doing. Or, you know, you use lots of ways to test these kind of what things. What you have to do is come up with a test in an area of the client's own importance. What they want, you have to show them that you can, they can achieve what they want doing it this way, not the other way, which was strenuous. In this way, is much less strenuous. Because it, it not only there's three levels that it works better at. One is subjective; people will say, "Oh, that felt nicer." Yes. The other is interpersonal. It's like, "Oh, I hated you less." What well, you know, you, I just felt friendlier towards you, and I responded differently. And there's the objective, the physical, the body right. responded differently, yeah. and I was able to. There's an objective measure, like with musicians, you you know, you can hear it in their voice, and right. it's not subtle. And you can hear it in the tone of the instrument when the musician breathes differently. Mm the tone of the non-wind in instruments, that will change too. So if, if people are listening to this and they have a bit of stress right now, like they're, you know, on the freeway and there's traffic or they're, you know, on the London Underground and they're, crowd, you know, they're listening on their iPad or their iPod where they're sort of crowded around people, what's something very simple they could do right now? Because you're known for your simple techniques. Let your tongue hang loose in your mouth. How does that change your throat and your shoulders? Many people report that it immediately relaxes their shoulders and relaxes their breathing, that your belly plop loose, which is culturally a no-no. <laughs> and uh, I always go into this, why are people supposed to sit with their bellies tight and their knees together? It's to make them pushovers. Yeah, and there's actually a sort of a sort of embodied feminist analysis of what you do, isn't it, in terms of people standing with their feet together, usually women, right, right. or their knees together. You know, if you're wearing a short skirt, that's almost you almost have to. No, you don't have to. If you, if the reason people are convinced that short skirts are beautiful is to get them to knee, put their knees together. And if you do that, and then you open your knees, you'll feel the difference in breathing. Most people find it easier to take a deep breath, a full breath, when their knees are apart yeah, and was, they're more stable. I was teaching a woman today, and she had um, uh, her knees sort of slightly rolled in, even though she was wearing trousers. There was this habit there, yeah, right. and that was affecting her lower back and her breathing and her whole posture. And it's quite counterintuitive or you know countercultural. Um, it can be quite difficult to uh, work with this with people. There's a lot of cultural resistance to this. Well, you have to go straight in, so yeah. to speak. Uh, I often have people who say my physical therapist told me to tighten my abdominals yeah. to spare my back. So I'll get a, a stick, a meter long stick, and have them push on one end while I push on the other. And they tighten their abdominals. Almost everybody immediately gets pushed back. And when they loosen their abdominals, their, their legs are more powerful and they can push me. And, and, and their back does not hurt. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's demonstrable that people are weaker in that yeah. position. You'll do a number of these, won't you? So you have someone stand in a stride stance. And again, people can find this on YouTube. So right. put in Paul Linden, I'll, I'll put it in the show notes as well. And you have them raise their eyebrows and what will happen? When they raise their eyebrows, almost everybody will be pushed back very easily. Why? Because the eyebrows going up is one part of the fear startle response where you pull back. I've never seen anybody lean forward and push forward with their eyebrows going up. It's just not done. And if they mumble? If they mumble, it's very much the same. If you count out loud, one, two, three, and then you're one, two, three. It's like the angry bunny rabbit, but in the other direction. And people can try this, yes. right? I mean, you know, speak out loud clearly in that kind of way and notice how that affects your whole embodiment. Right. And then, you know, if you, for example, if they're cycling, listen to this, they might find they start cycling quicker. You know, there's yes. a feedback mechanism there. There is. And if you try it and feel it, you don't have to believe it because you have data. And this is very unusual. So in the embodiment world, and I think you're, starting a bit of revolution here 
there's um generally it's done from a kind of religious based belief based point of view and someone from yoga will say you should stand like this and someone from tai chi says you should stand like this or breathe like this and they're not finishing their sentence you should stand like this for this purpose in this situation then it becomes testable and then we can say right let's see if that's true but it, it seems like for a long time in the embodiment world people haven't been interested in seeing what's true They've been interested in promoting uh, Gurus. a guru or a cult or religious or a sensei. Or, yeah, a sensei in Aikido. Uh, in yoga, it's like this is you know, the. It's very strange. People refer to authority for truth. They'll say, "Well, this is how you stand because such and such a Tai Chi teacher said, and they're very wise sensei." Well, that may be true, but it's very dangerous for the teacher and for the students if the teacher is put in a situation where anything he or she does is right and true because they did it, they can do anything. They it's will, right for they abuse, have no isn't feed, it? It's right, yeah. yeah, it's right for abuse. And um, it, they will swing wilder and wilder off the, the vertical, off the true, because they don't have any feedback. And the students are taught that they should be passive and let the guru do anything to them. And I often will, will have clients say, I can't tell good touch from bad touch. I'll reach over and stroke their arm in a sleazy kind of way, and they immediately cringe. I say, "Yes, you can." Yeah, yeah, that's 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 there within people. Yeah, um, yeah I was playing with Rachel, my sister, and I were playing with that today, and you know, it was kind of we're playing with it in a humorous way, but people get it immediately. Right. They get it. Um, I mean, also let's take back to the stride stance one, where someone's in a stride stance, one foot forward, you know, you know as if you were pushing a car, kind of strong position. Yeah, and the other one's got the hands on the shoulders, pushing them. And and what happens if they tell the truth versus if they tell a lie? Well, I often will say. Repeat after me, fish live in the water, and I push on their shoulders and I can't budge them. I'm only five, six. I usually pit in feet and in inches, of course. I uh, pick the biggest guy in the workshop, and then if they say fish live in trees, I can push them over. It's like a lie detector. You're just experiencing that the body does not like lies or unkindness. Now this sort of full body muscle testing as it were yes. and, you know it can be like you get people to say mean things to you and they right. become weak and they say kind things and say oh you're a nice man or I like your workshop and they get right. stronger yes so when people are kind and truthful they become physically stronger now i've heard i've studied ethics at university level and nobody speaks about this everyone thinks about ethics as some abstract principle yeah, right. handed down but your stance on it is radical well, listen to the word you use. My stance on it is radical. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, to say, but it's quite, it's quite, let's really, let's spell this out because it's profound, that ethics is built into the human body. Yes, it is. And health is a measure of ethics in a certain sense. Yeah. Um, I had one essay on uh, the climate degradation, and I, I have a, a picture of me sitting on a tree branch facing the trunk of the tree, sawing the, the limb off between me and the tree. And my caption is, you've got to be insane to do this. Yeah. And that's what the whole planet is doing. And we, uh, right, we're recording this for about a few weeks' time. We're recording this when there's all kinds of crazy storms in the yeah, United right. States. You know, you had to kind storms of fly north to get around them yes. to get here to the UK. And, um, you know, there's fires on the West Coast, there's storms there, yet people are still uh, denying there's any kind of influence of, well, of human They don't climate think climate rationally. If they were thinking, they would say, okay, it either is true or isn't. If it isn't true and we spend a bunch of money fixing it, no harm done. We, we've made the planet cleaner. If it is true and we spend a bunch of money fixing it, we've saved our, our whole planet. So it makes sense to go for the worst case scenario and try to fix that, not to deny. Now, a lot of your work's based on sort of rationality and logic mm -hmm. to the point where, you know, you, you're, what is it? You remember my, years ago, my ex-girlfriend Sonia said something yes, like, she lovely said, girl. She said, what was it she said? She said, he's, he talks like a scientist, but he's kind. <laughs> People are continuously uh, struck by the sort of consistent kindness of your embodiment. And I know I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, kissing your ass here. It's just something I continuously hear, and it almost annoys me. Actually, you get away with a lot more than I get away with. And it's partly because you're a cute little little old man, kind of, you know, with Parkinson's. But it's also that there's a sort of level of kindness there which people feel and pick up on, and they know I don't mean them any harm. Yeah, and it's it's quite tangible to people, even if they don't like when we've worked in Russia together right. or somewhere Israel or wherever. People even though maybe don't speak your language, but they they pick up on this physiologically. Yeah. That is something I constructed. 
it's natural to me now. 30 years ago, I was an angry son of a bitch. I was angry at everything. Uh, doorknobs, I'd be pissed at the <laughs> damn doorknob or whatever. And uh, through the practice of softening and opening and creating this f- sense of kindness in my body by thinking of something that made myself feel, feel kind, it became natural. I rarely, rarely get angry anymore. It's a behavior that I don't find helpful. I find it more helpful to empathize with people and to take them as they believe they should be taken. And then in that space of gentle kindness, I can do the job of cutting through their, their patterns. Give people something else that are listening to this, because your things are so quick and easy. I want to just give a bunch away on the, on the okay. podcast. You know? um, think of something that makes you angry or irritated or righteous. You're going to use this anger as fuel to, to, to do something to make the world better. And what do you feel in your body? Most people feel tension, compression, mm. and that's no way. If I come to you and I say, we've got to make peace, you asshole. Uh, we we <laughs> can't afford have, war. You literally have people screaming at you in the 60s like yes. this, right? And we right. see that today in protests as yes. well. It does, that's, well, the best thing to come out of the 60s was the slogan, fighting for peace is like fucking for chastity. <laughs> It doesn't work. It doesn't help. And it's so compelling, if nothing else. I mean, I remember not long ago, I was listening in an uh, Indian restaurant. Right at the other side of the restaurant, there was a woman sort of screaming obnoxiously about Brexit. I agreed with every word she said. But the obnoxiousness makes you disagree. I, I actually, by the time I left that restaurant, I wanted to change sides on that argument just because of the, the, just the unpleasantness of how it was coming across from her. You know? Well, people think, people have had modeled for them that power is abuse and they get angry as a source of power. Yeah. And it, it's actually a source of weakness and fatigue in the body. Yeah. It's, um, when I teach self-defense classes, I am very careful to say, this person attacking you is a human being. You may have to hit him, but you don't have to hate him. And I don't want to turn loose a bunch of people who casually kill people. <laughs> I want them to know what they're doing. I give them an assignment to go home and strangle a kitten with their bare hands. Of course, I don't let them do it, <laughs> but they say, oh, and I say, okay, if, if it's that hard to kill a kitten, it should be even harder to kill a human. You ha- if you have to do it, you have to do it, but you shouldn't want to or drive joy yeah. from it. And that's an experiment people can do listening to this, isn't it? It's just imagine strangling a baby bunny rabbit. Yes. And, you know, your natural response is is to tighten, to contract, to stop yeah. breathing. Right. I mean, even just saying it now, I've said that a hundred times in workshops, I'm still like, wow, why would I, you know, there's that sort of tightening that goes right. on. That's good. It's good to notice that. And this yes. is where it can be dangerous when people are numb, right? Right. Because they're not noticing that instinctive response to violence. When they're numb, they're shutting down their own perceptions. And when you do that, you dehumanize yourself. And as I said, you dehumanize the other. Have you ever seen a government say, okay, they they attacked, they killed a bunch of us. We have to retaliate. We have to protect ourselves. But remember, those are brothers and sisters, husbands and wives, children and siblings. They're human beings like us. Don't hate them, but we do have to kill some of them. And so you don't take a sort of pacifist stance, do you? You say, look, if someone were to you know, come into your house and try and rape you and kill you, then you have a right to throw them out the window. Yes. But you don't have to hate them, do you? Right, that. exactly, which is hard given our culture and our makeup. But um, if you hurt somebody else in a spirit of desiring that hurt, you're hurting yourself. You're destroying your, your humanity. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're objectifying yourself within that. You're yeah. brutalizing yourself. Yes, exactly. And people don't realize it's people who do violence also get brutalized as well as people yes. who are on the receiving end. Right. Right. They hurt. Imagine being living inside the skin of somebody who can relate to other human beings only by raping them. That's living in hell. Yeah, I was, I was working in Northern Ireland with some uh, people that had, was been released through the peace process but had done some heavy heavy violence we're right. talking you know dozens of murders yeah. and bombings and they were you could tell they were not happy people they were right. not at peace and they were looking to sort of get on the right side of god that's why I'm, you know was with them they were wanting to do peace work and youth work and community work and they were looking to sort of redemption you know yeah, but they but can't they unless so, they can release their body so brutalized in their right. own system right. you know they they were in hell it's uh it was uh 
tricky for them. And you could see how it was impacting their relationships. And some, one of them had children there, you know, his young teenage daughters there. And I was looking at their interactions and yeah. not a good place, you know, not a good place to be. And, and this is it kind of going to blow people's minds. And I know all sorts of people are going to sort of misinterpret this, but with love, you will hit harder yes. as well. And this right. is empirically yes. demonstrated. It's easy to demonstrate if you know how to hit but if you think of something that makes you happy inside, something that you love, what does it do to your body? Um, People you, try this now. Just yeah, take a moment. Right. Like, think of someone that you yeah. or something or makes something. you love. Smile. Yeah, a passage of Mozart or a flower. I just breathe a little bit easier. And and chest muscles relax. And when you're relaxed, force equals mass times acceleration. You can accelerate your punch harder. You can direct it more easily. You're not dragging with the parking brakes on, so to speak. And you can hit harder. I had one boy come to me. And he said the magistrate downtown said it's either work with Lyndon or go to jail. And I didn't even know the guy knew of my work. But he came in and the first thing he said was, I don't feel good unless and alive unless I'm kicking somebody in the head who's lying on the ground. I've taken him down. I said, show me your kick. And he said, what? I said, show me your kick. And he kicked, and I said, I can teach you to kick harder than that. And he said, what? <laughs> it was not the answer he, 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 he was expecting. But I showed him that if he relaxed, he could generate more force, okay? Next week. That's very demonstrative, yes, right? Like, right? It's like you can people can practice this at home by trying to throw something, trying yeah. to throw tents, and then try and throw a ball relaxed. It yeah, will go further. I would suggest you throw a washcloth so you okay. don't break any windows. But... Um, after a while, I had him meditating on loving kindness and a spirit of protectiveness. Why? Because it will relax you and let you hit harder. And I could demonstrate that it did. In the end, he stopped fighting because he'd been meditating on kindness and sensitivity to the other person. He didn't ask me when I started whether it would, he would want to hit harder, but... Um, and this is skillful means, isn't it? You yeah. meet people where they're at with what they're interested in. Yeah, exactly. And then it's like, okay, you in business might be okay. You want to make some more money. Okay. You want to make some more money. Then you need to communicate better. You need to communicate. Right. You need to relax. You need to teach you this, to teach you that. Exactly. So if you show them that you can actually hit harder by being kind hearted, they will do it and they won't want to hit high, harder by the time they can. And again, it's this approach where things are demonstratable, mm -hmm. where it's relating to things that people care about. Yeah. Okay, so let's see your areas of work. We've got uh, kids with ADHD that mm -hmm. need to focus. You've got yeah. all sorts of fun games yes. for that, haven't you? Like start, stop, and all yeah, sorts well, of things like that. We there, get to run around. Yeah, there's a, uh, yeah that, that's the one you're referring to. I think it was a state change game. Uh -huh. When I raise my arm, they run and yell. And, and they love flap. it because yeah, they get they, to go crazy, right? They, they flap their arms. And when I drop my hand, they drop to sitting and doing the breathing exercise in and out gently and calmly. Up they run, down they stay quiet, and I'm teaching them that they have within themselves the capacity to change from one state to the and other. And that's empowering for them yeah. as well, and kids like that because they're getting power over their state, and it's right. the same with the tickling, it's getting yeah. power over oneself. Yeah, and power over the other and when it's needed and appropriate. Um, power over is not necessarily bad, it depends what you want and why you, you want it and how you use it. Mm -hmm. One of my friends was a psychotherapist, and he wrote a book. He, he and his uh, book writing partner wrote a book uh, about the ethical uses of touch and psychotherapy. And everywhere he went, therapists said there are no ethical uses. So he finally resorted to uh, a reductio ad absurdum. He said, okay, we should never touch our clients because they have been hurt by touch. Also, you should never talk to your clients. <laughs> And that points out how absurd that it is. It's what you say and what you do it for and what your training is. Yeah, I mean, we live in a culture which is touch-phobic in the corporate world as well. And then, you know, therapy, because of the history of abuse, has got very touch-phobic. But that's making touch itself something to be scared of for right. people. And when you're scared of it, it becomes scarier. Uh huh. So you're working with kids, you're working a lot with abuse survivors and, you know, really hardcore mm -hmm. cases. You know, you're, I always have to stop you using some of the examples you use when we work with life coaches because it's pretty hardcore. Or something. I mean, you know, I'm not laughing at people. Yeah, here. I know. It's, 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 uh, but they have to know that it's possible that they, they will come across this. Yeah. And, and, and being able to be with that, you know, and in some, I mean, say a little bit more about trauma because that is 
you, your book winning is healing is yeah, a right. classic on this ebook we'll mm-hmm. plug all your ebooks at the end but that's a classic because trauma is now becoming sort of fashionable like yoga teachers are starting to learn about trauma mm-hmm. there's you know people like Stephen levine that put stuff around trauma out there it's becoming a kind of known thing levine. peter levine sorry I'm thinking Stephen levine. The, deaf, the deaf yeah, guy right, yeah. Yeah. um uh, so yeah trauma is becoming sort of known as an area what's your take on trauma okay, my take on it is the distress response when you can't do anything about the event and the distress response stays in your body over a long period of time that is the the, the state of being traumatized so it's like being stuck in fight or flight and that's yeah. a very simplistic way of yeah, looking exactly. at it but it's that's... not simplistic at all that's what it is right so they're stuck in that agitation or the numbing right yeah and they can't do anything about it. They couldn't then. And their self-construct is based on the idea of weakness. I cannot do anything directly to help myself. Therefore, I will do what? I will drink. I will run a marathon once a week. I'll do anything to shunt the awareness aside so I don't have to feel it or think about they're it. They're numbing, but you can't selectively right. numb, right? So they're also numbing the good Everything. emotions in right. their life, the feeling, yeah. the basis of their empathic relationships, yeah. etc. I had one woman who was almost, she was obese, and she would typically not go for 10 minutes without a can of Coke in her hand. Right. And when I took her into that, she experienced that the bubbles covered up the taste of cum in her mouth from her father. So she was always drinking Coke to not feel, and that sugar blew her up like a balloon. Wow. What I taught her was how to pull his dick out of her mouth and how to kill the sucker, and then she felt a lot better. Right. She didn't have to cover up a, a sensation. And you, you know, these are some fairly dark places you go to, yes. you know, satanic rituals and not often, rapes, but, and yeah. you know, these are things that you're working with around people but you actually do this with a sense of humor this is what yes. might, i mean people might be listening to this feeling really shocked at what you yeah. just said i remember the first time i sat in on one of your sessions i was like fuck hell i was like yeah, barely right. traumatized myself for a week you know yeah. these days we can talk about cases fairly yeah. straightforwardly i'm still not quite as kind of i might say cool with it as you but you actually bring humor to this yeah. you have people laugh at their well exactly um i had one guy under my hands as i took him into a more relaxed state relive being raped as a ritual with a by a group of people he came out shocked and i said quick how many ritual abuse perpetrators does it, does it take to screw a light bulb he said what and i said 13 one to screw it and 12 to chant and he broke out laughing he thought that was the funniest thing he ever heard good thing he did because if i had told that joke and it didn't work but I knew it would work. There's a, there's a rhythm to yeah. how you use humor, isn't yes, there it? Is. It's quite specific. And yeah. I, I, you're from a Jewish background. Like, I wonder if some of it's influenced, because I don't see many of the other American teachers, I know right. any of them actually, doing it. And I wonder if there's something in the Jewish tradition. Yeah, that, there is. I think the, the storyteller, um, the Borscht Belt humorist, um, but I, I don't know exactly what it is, but I think you're right. It's in there somewhere in the culture. And I, I you know, I was working with the gay community in Russia recently, and we were sort of sharing our best lesbian jokes. Uh-huh. And there was a way in which it was sort of empowering for people to say, look, you can't throw this at me. Like, we can laugh at ourselves. Yeah, you right. know? And obviously done it in the right way. So it's not abusive yeah. or nasty, you know, with right. a certain spirit. And also in a certain point in a process, there's a way yeah. in which taking people into something, humor just gets in the way but then when you're taking them out of exactly it, it can be really helpful yeah you're giving them the ability to laugh at the perpetrator that gets you breathing and takes your power back and as you say it's empowering isn't it it's, it's, it seems to sort of create space between the pattern and the, yeah, the thing right. that happened that was bad and them. i probably shouldn't do this but i think i will what did Satan say to Hitler when Hitler got to hell? I don't know. He said, oh, if I'd have known you were coming, I would have baked the cake. Paul, I've heard that before. Paul is known for his awful, awful jokes. That's not my joke. I just repeated it. You do realize that we're going to get accused of anti-Semitism now on well, this podcast, Paul, can't despite see. the fact that you're Jewish. I've got some great jokes as well that I picked up in Israel, but I can't say them. Yeah, but I can. But you can. Yeah. You can. It's been uh, a kosher approved. Yeah. What I'm trying to illustrate is Hitler's dead and we are still alive. <laughs> and it, you, you, there, is that, there is this um, thing I've come across in Israel that every public holiday is they tried to kill us 
they didn't let's eat some food yeah exactly that, that seems to be the, the, the basic <laughs> thread of any kind of jewish holiday as far yeah, as well, i can pretty, tell pretty much but it's victim humor when a victim is alive and tells a, a joke about the the pain and misery yeah it changes their relation to the pain and misery yeah uh, and you know people can have individual trauma but we've also worked in populations social, like social cultural israel and russia yeah, right. ukraine places with ireland workshops, ireland there where i've been and it you know the, there's a way in which is sort of endemic in a lot of yes, places it's endemic all over germany austria my country the u.s was founded on genocide and slavery Nobody talks about it, but it's still flowing. Uh huh. And yeah. you had the British Empire, obviously, enslaved yeah. half the planet. We've yeah. got our own history of that. My family are Irish. There's history there. Right. And, and you've worked in Germany quite a bit. Now, yeah. that's quite interesting as well, isn't it? I mean, you actually speak pretty good German as far as I understand. At this point, it. yes. Yeah. They tell me my accent is spot on, but my grammar sucks. Well, that's trying to learn okay. German grammar is, is a form of torture. Yeah. You, you know, that shouldn't be allowed by the UN, German, German grammar. Well, maybe uh, it should. Okay. <laughs> but we'll pass on that. So, do you remember that experience you told to me about being in Germany and you're on a train? Yes. And they asked you if you'd like a shower when you got to where no, you no, were no. going. Was that what no, happened? You're mixing two stories. Okay, excuse me. Tell well, both. One tell person both. was, uh, Don Levine was on a train and he was going to the same conference I was near Frankfurt. and um, Also Jewish. He's another yeah, mentor right. of mine, sadly deceased yes. now. Yeah. He said, looking at the people on the, this is an express train, looking at the Germans standing on the railroad platform waiting for their train, he freaked. And it, I don't know how he learned it. He was slightly older than I. But it came back to the people in the cars, cattle cars being shipped to Auschwitz or whatever, seeing the free population Outside standing on. they were locked in the train. Right, so, exactly. Yeah, Don actually lost family in that, yeah. Yeah, you know, in similar situations. So he's only one or he was quite old at that point. He's only one generation, I think, from that. Yeah. yeah. And my experience, the first time I taught in, taught in Aikido course in Germany, it was where there was group showers. I walked into the shower and I froze because Cyclone B, the gas, was used in the showers. In the showers and yeah. I didn't know that it was in me to freeze, but somehow we transmit trauma from people, from person to person. And I, I've seen this, my wife's third generation from Ukrainian starvation. So her grandparents were in, you know pretty hard times in Ukraine. People were eating each other's kids and stuff. I don't think her grandparents were particularly that. I shouldn't badmouth them, but it was certainly hard times there were yeah. in terms of lack of food and something like 20 million people died. It was a huge Holocaust, essentially. Right. Uh, a huge genocide, I should say. Uh, it's not so well known, but um, there's just two generations of that. But still, when she eats food, she kind of keeps it quite close and, all, and eats it quite quickly and is quite protective of the food, even though she grew up in um, uh, actually, you know, fairly wealthy family with plenty of, she's never starved in her life, you know. The brain is built <clears throat> to learn danger. If you've tried to memorize a poem in school, it takes forever. You have to go over and over yeah. again. But the brain will learn danger and escape in one shot, one trial. Yeah. And so that's what we're good at. But we're too good at it. And so, so we're all walking around responding as if it was life and death. It is life and death. <laughs> to, you know, having these fight flight responses, right. which were, were sort of evolutionary, potentially helpful at some point. Well, they, were, they were potentially helpful, but not as helpful as they could be. Yeah. And so I've tried to develop this simplified technology to replace something that doesn't work well. And as you say, it is a technology yeah. and you do have to learn it yeah. to be a response to sort of pressure right. and stress. Yeah. And you've learned that through the martial art of Aikido, which is a great testing ground for this. I've used Aikido places. as a laboratory. Um, I don't know that most people in Aikido learn this because I don't know that they are, they break it down the same way. Or that they're interested. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I think often you'll see in a martial arts class people just deepening their sort of trauma and their fight flight response by excessively kind of attacking mm, each other right. and not realizing that they have to work in that sweet spot of calibration yeah. of not too little, not too much, the sort of Goldilocks kind of principle there. Well, that's similar. I think however valuable psychotherapy is, if you don't teach people empowerment first so they can self-regulate while they talk about what happened to them, you're practicing having them learn, 
you're, you're, you're having them practice being overwhelmed. They're just going back into a state of embodied weakness yeah. as, as they discuss exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. If you can interrupt that by saying, stay in your power that Paul has taught you, then you can talk about the stuff that happened without being re-victimized by it. And then you can come out with something that will work better. Yeah. We're covering a lot of ground here. So we've talked about Aikido, which you have a very different take on than most Aikido sensei. So I don't want people to listen to this and think they go to any Aikido dojo in the world and they'll get, you know, this kind of training. Right. It's, it's, it's pretty rare what you're talking about. And Miles talks about, Miles Kessler we had on here, talks about the evolution of response. He's another sort of, I call enlightened Aikido or Aikido <laughs> I don't mean that in the sort of Buddhist sense, but working uh, intelligently, we mm. might say. Yeah. Uh, some yoga classes, I guess, there's some sense of this. You know, you can be in a posture and then learn to relax into that and not be triggered by it. Um, so we've looked at your Aikido. You know, your body work's pretty unique as well. You're you're not kind of just massaging people, are right. you, as a body worker? What I'm doing on the physical level is creating spaciousness inside the body. What that translates to is spaciousness in the feelings. Mm. Uh, you don't get small and cramped and respond to to something in a negative way, um, the the techniques I've developed are very rapid. Um, you can basically well, I'll give you one for example. If somebody has a part of their body that they can't let release, I might take if it's their arm, for example. Quite a tension. Yeah, I would grab their arm with their permission. I would say, "Help me." and help me, I would move their arm in, certain, in, yeah. in a direction. Then I'd say resist, and they can. Then I'd say help, and then i say resist. Then i say help, resist, resist, help, help, resist. They get so it pissed, they let or go they, I say let it go, and they just drop it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and there's you know, fairly simple body work teams. We're about to do a four-day training. Mm -hmm. I think we did five days last year, the year before, four or five days you know, people can pick up quite a lot in that yeah. time. And, you know, like the starfish where we're just gently extending the limbs yeah. in a very subtle, we're not pulling on anything. Right. It's just a slight intentional. Yeah. A, a slight intentional um, joining with their body and drawing the limbs outward. You've got two arms, two legs and one head. That's like a starfish and just draw it open. Yeah. No, my, my wife loves that one. And we, we don't do it as sort of therapeutic body work, right. obviously, but she just likes the feeling it gives her exactly. and it's this sense of spaciousness that yeah. she really enjoys. Or there's the jellyfish one, which is another one she enjoys. Yeah. It just wobble someone's yeah. leg. Well, luckily I have an automatic jellyfish wobbler with your Parkinson's arm. Yes. It makes it very simple. I just put it on the spot and it wobbles. Hmm. It's very cool. Yeah, I see that you do it when it wobbles their body and then they, there's, there's a way in which it just relaxes the, yeah, the exactly. system through that. They cease to resist if you set up a wave through their body. At some point, they will cease to resist the wave. Now, and the irony of a body worker developing Parkinson's, someone that spent their whole life... Learning about movement. Learning the about irony movement. Of, of an Aikidoist is what? Um... Here I am, and I'm doing the best I can with the resources that I've got. I've had Parkinson's for 14 years. I've still been traveling and teaching and wanting to plant the seeds of this stuff. Um, it took me literally 20 years to get something about power in the sitting posture that I can now teach in 30 seconds, literally. You use this very quick, isn't it? Because it's not esoteric. Right. Like, um, you know, in terms of sitting... Uh, you know, finding the sit bones, finding the hip socket. Yeah, exactly. These are really straightforward things for yeah. people to get a sense of. Can you could you even lead someone through that if they were sitting and listening to this at home? Yes. Um, if they couldn't see the video, so we'll make right. sure it's just for the audio. Okay. Um, stand up, please, and put your fingers in your hip joint. Now, the problem is that the English language, the American English at least, doesn't even have a name for the hip joint, not a, a common name. The hip joint is not the hip bone. The hip joint is where your leg folds. The pubic symphysis, the bone above the genitals, if you move out from that at, uh, four or five centimeters, an inch or two, that will, will be where the hip socket folds. And if you stand up, put your fingers in that, and push your tail back. So just to give some people some idea of the distance here, that's about as wide as an iPhone or a pair of sunglasses, yeah, right? right give people a rough idea and you push back from you there. push with your fingers you push the tailbone back incline forward as you do and push your tail down to sitting posture that will be an entirely different way of sitting it frees up the spinal column it supports the body differently 
and takes a lot of strain off. So there's a sitting thing you do. We've talked about softening the core, mm-hmm. which is the mouth, mm-hmm. the belly, the mm-hmm. genitals. Right. Yeah, and we've talked about, we haven't talked about expansiveness. So there's a few, there's not that many, but there's what, five major pieces yeah. of what you the do. The shining is one. Um, haven't talked about that. No, we think. haven't. So give, give people something they can work with. And again, don't believe him. Try it. See yes, what it does. Exactly. There are no wrong answers. There are no wrong experiences. It's just what you experience. There's lots of complex ways you teach intentional reaching. Yeah. But I think the simplest um, is, okay, um, intentional reaching. That, did we change topic quickly? Go for shining. Go okay, for shining. shining. Right. That's what we were doing. If you were a firefly's butt or a star, or a light bulb, what would you do? You'd shine, right? That's what they do. So can you feel every centimeter of your skin shining out into the room, into space around you? What does that do? Many people find it opening, relaxing, um, presencing. And if you hold that along with the soft core, you've got something that starts inside and bridges to the outside. And it's it's not enough just to soften because people can collapse. Right, that's it's not, not enough just to have posture because it can be kind of rigid. Right. You know, it's kind of alignment. Piece. Yeah, the the shining is regulated by the sitting and walking, the inguinal sitting and walking, as they call you it. You haven't talked about walking yet, yeah. but you walk with this push from the back foot. Right, don't exactly. You, right? And there's a, the same way that the pelvis supports the spinal column when you're sitting, uh, the leg thrusts up the spinal column and also forward. So you get something which lifts you, makes you more dignified if you're doing it, and more efficiently forward moving. And I've seen you apply this to dancers and yoga yeah, people and right. Aikido, it's, you know, whatever, more com- you know, musicians, right. more complex forms. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you do so often work just sitting on a bench and walking mm-hmm. across the room. And, yeah. and then you'll add, you know, your games around um, color, for example. That's another nice one people can play okay. with. I think that every adjective in the language and lots of the nouns are spe- will specify emotional states. So if I said to you, can you talk to me with a silky feeling in your body? How would that be different than if I said, can you talk to me with a feeling of sandpaper in your body? <laughs> People get that quite. Yeah, right. It's metaphorical, but it's not just abstract. It concretely yes, it influences your body. It goes into the voice if or it, whatever it is. If it is, didn't, yeah. it wouldn't be a metaphor. Yeah. And so if you pick the right combination of metaphors, um, you're training your body to be a certain way and talk about some of the color ones because that's the sort of thing again someone's driving in the car someone's walking to work they're in the new york subway or san francisco wherever i would suggest to keep your eyes open while you're driving (laughs) that helps um if you imagine that your body is a color sponge and you're going to take in not dishwashing liquid but colors can you take in a sense of vibrant yellow what does that feel like compared to taking in a sense of deep cobalt blue? Like a daffodil yellow, not the ghastly luminous yellow yeah, right. you're wearing there. It yeah. is not ghastly or luminous, sir. It's <laughs> we'll luminous and ghastly. One day. Okay. <laughs> so bright daffodil yellow, how would it be to absorb that? Yeah. And how would that affect your mood? Yeah. If you imagine the darkest black velvet, and say in Aikido, the punch comes in and you're feeling like black cat in a black room wearing mm. a black velvet mm. overcoat, if cats do, you get this hidden quality. Well, we had Vilya on the show yeah. the other day, Alexandra Vilvoskaya, who you know from Moscow. Right. I mean, she's just this, even even when she's not wearing black, she kind of blends in somehow, doesn't she? Yeah. She's a ninja shadowy creature, you know. I, mean, I remember years ago, me and you playing with this, where one of us would do a color, then we'd throw the other one with Aikido, yeah, right. and we'd try and guess the color, yeah, and be like, right. oh, that was bluish, or, you know, that was, re-. someone said I was very red today. And they said, oh, I love your redness. Mm-hmm. So I was being, you know, provocative and rude and energetic. And, you know, Sounds normal to me. <laughs> I was being markish. Yeah. And uh, they're like, oh, I could do with some of your redness. And I said, okay, so steal the redness. Yeah. They, they actually gave themselves the metaphor i said great so you might not want to be like me all the time but you know occasionally you might want to be a sponge and absorb the redness yeah. and they go, oh. well, you know that, that was exactly and one of these ways in doesn't work for everyone right, right. like you, you might works have a, for everyone. a color or a metaphor or a taste or a sound or a music or yeah. you might work with vocalization you mm-hmm. might work with posture and you're you're finding things that work with people yeah what i'm doing basically is helping them achieve kindness power and spaciousness 
and this idea of being kindness, practicing kindness, yeah. that this is something, you know, we tend to think of love in the abstract, whereas you tend to think of it almost mechanically. Yes, it's a behavior in the body. And if you want to get better at doing it, you got to practice. And this is profound. You know, I remember I was raised Christian mm-hmm. and the, the priest when I was, you know, Catholic, whatever school said, um, love thy neighbor. How? And that was my question. I was like, all right, well, that's a nice idea. But when my mate James pisses me off, I like, want to kick his head in. You know, it's quite rough lad. Yeah. And I just, I was like, what's your method? Is kind of what I was getting. Yeah, I didn't and quite they, have the they words generally for it. don't have one. They were like, well, just love them. I'm like, yeah, but can you be a bit more specific? And I, I, I just left going, well, I'm not anti that. It sounds nice. Yeah, well. But it, give me something I can use. Exactly. And I hear the same thing yeah. in business. They're like, give me something I can use. And the method, the how, and you're big on what's called operational language. Yes. And I'm going to put this in several podcasts because it's a pet bugbear among people don't do it. Um, what's operational language, Paul, as opposed to non-operational language? If you wanted to study people like cherry pie, how would you find out who likes cherry pie? You could ask them, do you like cherry pie? And they say, yeah. Or you could get some kind of cherry pieometer that you stick in their ear and it measures directly the sensation. Ooh, I dig it. I like it. Or you could watch for a behavior. If you eat one slice of cherry pie two days a week for a month, I'll consider you as that's my cutoff for liking cherry pie. Some objective measure yeah. there. You convert the feeling, the abstract piece to something that is objective and measurable, and it's then usable. If I say to you, love your enemies, and I don't say how, you can't. If I say, don't feel negative when the punch comes in that's not telling you anything it's telling you what not to do but it doesn't tell you how to do something so concrete operational instruction is the methodology the how give me an example okay if i'm punching you and you feel like you're trying to flinch and get away can you think of me as a poor guy who needs your help so you want you want to help me down to the ground Mm -hmm. and then call for a therapist or it could be relax your belly. Yeah, exactly. Or it could be soften your jaw. It could be open your peripheral vision yeah, anything so you can that see works, widely. Anything that works to take you out of the fight or flight response. And then I punch you and you do that. This time you won't feel negative. You'll feel that you want to help me and you'll be able to move more easily. So the clear thing is it's an instruction. Yeah that people can actually do. And my students joke that I've ruined 90% of yoga and dance classes for them as Good. a result of That's learning nice. this. Because they go to the class now and the student says, you know, something outrageous, ridiculous, extend your, you know, shoulders right. or whatever. And they might be talking about a very genuine, real experience. But they them. haven't conveyed it. Yeah, but then you're, you're either guessing or you just go, oh, fuck, I don't know what they're talking about. Right. You know? Well, I generally go for the second. I've said to more than one person, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. Yeah, and they general one person um, said in response, they pay me to teach like and talk like a new ager. <laughs> they won't pay me if they if I talk like you. I said so. Do what you want. It, well, it almost sounds too easy, too straightforward, doesn't it? And if people look at your books, I highly recommend Paul Lee books. They um, it sounds so straightforward. I remember years ago, the first time I saw them, I thought, really, is this it? Yeah. Is this is this all there is? Because I thought I was waiting for the magic. You know, I was well, waiting. It for isn't the... all there is, but I've tried in the books to capture the simplest stuff that I've been able to come up with. Because we want to spread it, we want to scale it, yeah. we want to actually people to be out. You know, you can tell. Like, what is your story about going through um, immigration? Oh yeah. I was coming back from Munich, I think, and I was in Philadelphia, probably. I said, as the um, customs agent asked, border control agent asked, what were you doing? I said, I was teaching a workshop on peacemaking and conflict. He said, can you give me any hints? This place is a zoo. So he's like stressed at yeah, work. and Stressed it to the max. And there's 100 people in line. I said, yeah, let your tongue hang loose. He did, and he smiled. So that takes a lot of the strain off my neck. So with the 30-second interaction and these concrete tools, I was able to give him something which changed his life. And well, that, that's what I'm trying for, simplicity. Paul, I can see your tie, and I know you wanted to speak a little bit about kind of logic and that okay, yeah. piece. Is there anything you want to speak about in that before we go to kind of wrapping up? Yes. One of the things that I've been looking at recently um, is formal elements of logic and speaking. If you make a statement and you say... Um, frogs are good you have to say to whom for what if you don't then there's no way to to deal with it if you say frogs are good and you say frogs are green 
that is very different kind of language. Mm -hmm. One is an evaluation and the other is a statement. Mm -hmm. yep. And a lot of people who've been abused have heard statements, you're worthless, and they hear that as a statement, yep. they take it in. And if they can understand that the end of the sentence is, you're worthless to me, then you just throw the guy away and yeah. go find somebody to whom you are worthwhile. For what? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And uh, in another sense, I've recently been playing with models. Um, so if a, a model of a domain is a cognitive picture of what it is, like a map. And if I say, um, okay, if I say that this domain, okay, I'll give you an example. Somebody said to me, what I do to calm down is I allow the light of the universe to come into my body. And I say, okay, that's a map that says you do this and you get that. My map is when I let my belly loose, when I let my throat loose, when I let my body soften, then I relax and I can feel more. Um, I realized that she was creating a map which had no way to influence it. If the light of God is coming into you, what do you do, pay God extra for more light? Yeah, it's disempowering in yeah. the sense that you're not, it's passive. You're not at that point where I can actually do something. Right. Yeah, it's why we ask people, what did you do in your body exactly. when we throw a tissue at them? Yeah. But when I, I think she was, well, she was constantly asking me, how do you do this Aikido move? She's an Aikidoist. And I said, I'm doing the move inside your body, not on the outside. She said, how? And I realized she won't be able to do it and she won't get her answer until she shifts her frame to saying, um, emotions are actions in the body. As long as her, sh her frame was it comes from outside, she is primed to notice things outside of her, but she's not primed to notice inside. And mm. so my sense of logic is it's very important in the model you use uh, to get it clean, and then you have to deal with the, with the language in certain other ways as well. And it's interesting where your logic comes from. It comes from a mix of computer programming and pogo comics. <laughs> well, so there's, a, there's they, an unusual you know, combination. Yeah, the there. computer programming, yes. The pogo comics, were, that's where I get my humor from. <laughs> uh, but uh, the logic is standard logic, and the, that was what I did in my bachelor's. I pursued a philosophy degree and did a lot of work with language analysis. And it's, it's, you know, your, if you don't mind me saying, on here, autistic spectrum, right? Yeah, as well. Somewhat, so, slightly, so yeah. slightly kind of Asperger's. Yeah. So that's a kind of factor in here, right? Yeah. I'm, I feel sad that so much embodied work has got almost anti-logic, anti-reason. Yeah. It's just feel, don't think. Yeah. You know, there's almost an, and, and I get where that's come from historically, the, you know, Western world, very scientific, very logical, kind of push back against that. But the kind of illogic of the field just doesn't help anyone, yeah. well, does You it? don't push back against it. If you don't like it, you work with it. You go with it. Mm. So adding feeling to yeah, logic right. rather than trying to replace one with the yeah. other. I don't mean to grow up to be a Vulcan. <laughs> um, I don't mean to grow up at all, actually, now that I think about it. <laughs> a, you almost you almost don't have to now, Paul. Yes. I think you've almost gotten away with it. Okay, uh, that's good. The career of... of, of uh, um, I can see you're tired. I, you know, you need to rest and mm -hmm. work you tomorrow. Um, any kind of final message around your thing? I, You know, for me, I feel I feel sad that is probably the last time we have you in the UK. Yeah, you know, as your Parkinson's progresses, you've been writing books like absolute monster since you were diagnosed with yeah. Parkinson's. You've done right. about a book a year, haven't you? Right. And well, any last minute things? Yes. Um, where Mark and I, where you and I met, was at a IK Extensions conference in. Um, this is Cyprus. Cyprus. So that was where, like, yeah. People are coming together through Aikido in a kind of peace building. We had project. Americans and Iraqis and Israelis and Palestinians, Greeks and Turks practicing together. And I was there as a teacher, but I didn't teach the Aikido. I taught a, a section on genocide. And I said, okay, you've come to the peace table because you're, you're convinced that war just isn't going to work. And the person sitting opposite you tortured and killed your mother. What does your body do? How, do you, how will that affect the negotiations? And how can you change that? And that's what I have spent the last year or two putting together, peacemaking. I want to prevent some trauma and give people tools for being able to dialogue on the foundation of a quiet body and an unshackled intellect. If you can keep yourself quiet and stable and calm and loving, um, then I think you have a better chance of coming up with something that will work. And I'm doing the last traveling trying to teach that. I want to get it across. I want to plant seeds places. And th that's what we're doing here. And I appreciate 
all your help, Mark. Great. And yeah, it's been a profound thing to me to bring it to Northern Ireland. And we've got, I'm going back there in a few months, you know, we're training yoga teachers to do it there because they already have a lot of the kind of base skills. Yeah. Obviously the Russians are well on their way from kind of working there. Ukrainian links continue. And, um, you know, you've, I know you've worked in Israel, there's people there who are interested in this work. Uh, and it's only a piece of the puzzle, right? We don't right. have to say that, yeah, you know, we can solve all the world's problems with this, but it's no. certainly a bloody useful piece. Well, if you don't regulate your anger and your fear, it's almost a guarantee that nothing will work. If you do regulate your, your anger and fear through somatic centering, it's not a guarantee that anything will work, but it's the best chance that it You're might. You're in with a chance of yeah. at least stepping off the train tracks. Right. And um, that work is look up embodied peace building or embodied peacemaking of, under two categories. Yeah. I've seen it. I've got videos online. We've got, uh, you can look on YouTube. If you put Paul Linden coaching, you'll see actually some of his work and you'll see him sort of live. Did a really nice series of videos of uh, working in Russia in the woods. It was really quite a pleasant backdrop. Nice yeah, people. It was lovely. All spoke, spoke good English. So it's there, you know, international audience. Some of you've got books translated into a number of languages mm-hmm. as well. If you want to read you in German or Russian or various other uh, uh, things in, in terms of your ebooks, the embodied peacemaking ebook is that was my textbook actually for like corporate stress work for mm-hmm. years when I started right. my company, just because it's so practical and it's full of pictures. Um, so that's well, where can I get the ebooks, Paul? Is okay, it? at my website, that is being hyphen in hyphen movement.com, B E I N G hyphen in hyphen movement.com. And Paul will respond to emails. If you yes. email him, I know that you're pretty good on that. Um, so, you know, you're able to take invites around the world currently. Yes. So the other thing, people, several of my students and Aikido friends and various people have done is come did what I did, which is to come and stay with you. Yes. And that's obviously something you could continue doing. Right. Um, in Columbus, Ohio, which is a dull but pleasant enough town. Right. In, it in has the all the sophistication <laughs> of a glass of warm water, I think. <laughs> but, but it's a pleasant place to yeah, study with you. So I didn't is. have any distractions there when I was there. Uh, me neither. <laughs> and, <laughs> so that's something else people can do. Loads of videos loads of ebooks the ebooks are you know well worth it in terms of the and you've even got you've got free ebooks on yeah, right. the building and stuff like that yeah. um and, and often you know i'll do you take your work if i'm going somewhere anyway i'll tag on a day of embodied peace building if there's yeah. a group who are that's, interested that's free good. of charge you know as a yeah. sort of gift to the russian gay community or the israelis or whoever you know wherever i am doing a business job i'll mm-hmm. just you know so i'm able to do some of this work when you when you're not um yeah. I, I would like to express my deep appreciation and friendship for you as we've become colleagues. It's really been wonderful working with you, Mark. And I thank you. Thanks, Paul. Don't make me cry on the podcast now. Well, it's, that's okay. Uh, it's, no, I mean, uh, you're one of the few people that I've, of my teachers, really the only one that was able to transition from being a mentor to a colleague. You know, we co-teach together now. Right. I assist. And, I, and there's a difficult transition somehow for a lot of teachers. Mm-hmm. And... Um, you know, you've profoundly affected my life in many ways. And uh, well, thank now you for you're going to make me cry. <laughs> That's okay. We're tough, man. We can cry. We can cry. I love you, man. And I'm going to uh, turn off the recording now and give you a big cuddle, I think. <laughs> If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe to get more. If you'd like to help us build the Embodied Tribe, leave a review on iTunes or share this on your social media. If you're interested in training globally, sign up to receive the newsletter at embodiedfacilitator.com. Until next time, welcome home to the body.